Welcome to uh, YEP's uh, Know Your Right series. Today we are doing a, uh, a briefing on the asylum process and we are glad to have with us two staff attorneys from AYUDA. We have with us Beatrice and Catherine Chen and they'll be giving us an overview of the asylum process, the application process and timeline. And without further ado, I will uh, go ahead and introduce Beatrice to come up. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is, as uh, you already know, is Beatriz Ortiz. I'm a staff attorney at Ayuda, and today we're going to be discussing what is asylum, the different types of asylum, and how to file an asylum application. So first, uh, I want to make very clear that everything that I say here should not substitute you go into an attorney, immigration attorney, and consult your case. So this is for you to know, to know your rights, to know your basis, basic rights of asylum, but you have to go to an immigration attorney, or we recommend that you go to an immigration attorney before you file the asylum application. What is asylum? Well, asylum is a form of protection that allows an individual to remain in the United States is instead of being removed or deported to a, to a country where he or she fears persecution or harm. Under United States law, people who flee their home country because they fear persecution can apply for asylum. If the, if the person is granted asylum, this gives him or her the protection and the right to stay in the United States. Asylum may be granted to Refugee status or asylums may be granted to people who have been persecuted or fear they will be persecuted on account of their race, religion, nationality, and membership in a particular social group or political opinion. I want to make clear also that when we're talking of the the persecution on account of we're talking persecution individually to a person that is filing the asylum claim. It is not, we cannot say that the person is filing for asylum because she fears that there is too much crime in their home country. This is not something that asylum covers in the United States. So the account of, persecuted on account of under uh, immigration law means that you have to be persecuted individually, you or your family. Um, the attorney that is going to consult you has to do an analysis to see if under the law what happened to you in your home country uh, applies to the asylum uh, application that you're filing. So that's why it's I always say it's very important to first go to an immigration attorney. So how do you do that? How do you apply for asylum? To file for asylum, a person in the, in the United States must be physically present in the United States or be seeking entry to the to a United States at a port entry. You must file the asylum within a year arriving in the United States. This is very important and why this is why it's in bold. Um, there are, are exceptions to the one-year bar, obviously, because laws always have ex exceptions. But if you are here and you believe that you were persecuted in your home country, you need to file the asylum as soon as possible. And as soon as possible is before a year here in the United States. There are two paths to claim asylum in the United States. There's affirmative asylum or defensive asylum. And affirmative asi in affirmative asylum, a person who is not in removal proceedings, meaning immigration hasn't detained them, may apply for asylum through the USCIS, which is the US Citizenship and Immigration Service. This agency is a division under the Department of Homeland Security. When you file your asylum application, eventually you're going to have an interview with an asylum officer. 
and you're going to present your case with your proof. That asylum officer will interview you and will decide if the asylum is granted or denied. If the asylum officer does not grant the asylum, the applicant is going to be referred to removal proceedings where he or she may renew the request for asylum through the differences process. This has his exceptions because sometimes the person has some kind of status when the asylum is denied. This happens sometimes to TPS recipients um, and the person can stay with, with the status that it has if, if it has some kind of status after going to the asylum officer. But in most cases, the case is referred to immigration law. Ah, sorry, to immigration court. And in immigration court, you have the opportunity to present your asylum case one more time in front of an immigration judge, okay? I'm gonna explain that more a little later, but defensive asylum, it's for persons who are in removal proceedings and they may file for asylum defensively by filing an application with an immigration judge at the executive office for immigrant review, which is the EOIR. In, and this office is under the Department of Justice. Defensive asylum is applied as a defense against removal from the United States. So when does it happen? Well, let's say you are at a border and you say that you are gonna apply for asylum in the United States, then you are supposedly immediately, but you are referred to the immigration court and then you can have your asylum claim filed in the immigration court. Um, this has to be also done in one year, so it's not different from when you file in USCIS. Uh, persons who are not in, in the immigration court sometimes don't know that they have to file for asylum within a year, because when you are in proceedings, most of our clients or most of the immigrants uh, go to an attorney because they have a master's or they, ha they have documents that the officer gives them. So they know or they should know that they get, uh, should go to an attorney. But when you are not in immigration proceedings, it's important for everyone to know that you have to file the asylum in one year. In the defensive asylum, uh, individuals are in removal proceedings after being apprehended, means taken into custody in the United States, or at the port of entry without proper legal documents or in violation of their immigration status. One example is an expired visa. When you come into the United States with a tourist visa, you have a timeline for that visa, and that visa has an expiration date. So if you stay in the United States and your visa expires and for some reason you are detained, this normally happens because the person is driving most of the time and an officer stops them and uh, then eventually they get detained and uh, they get referred to the immigration court. So when you go to the immigration court, you have to defend yourself to, from being removed from the United States. And one of the defenses that, that's why it's called defensive asylum, one of the defenses that you have is that you fear to go back to your home country. This, um, this means that you have to file the asylum always within one year, and the court, the judge, the immigration judge is gonna give you what it, called an individual hearing. And in that hearing, you're going to present all your proof, your documents, and your why you need to stay in the United States to protect you from the persecution that you're suffering in your home country. If you are detained in the border by US Customs Border Protection trying to enter the uh, trying to enter in the United States without the proper documentation 
and are placed in expedited removal process and are found to be credible, uh, have found to be credible fear of persecution or torture by an asylum officer, then you are directly referred to the immigration court. In these cases, you have to say to the officials that you fear to go back to your home country in order for the asylum officer to make you an interview. So it's important that you say that you are here in the United States because you fear to go back to your home country. If you don't say that, then the asylum officer is not going to the, do the interview and you're not going to be referred to the immigration court. You're just going to be deported before you are referred to the immigration court. How do we, we file for asylum in, in practical terms? What, what we should do? So the applicant must file what is called a form I-589. This are, you are going to file in USCIS if you are not detained or not in immigration proceedings and in immigration court if it's a defensive asylum and you are in immigration proceedings. It says here, follow the instructions of the I-589 form. This is the part that I really, really ask people to go to an attorney. These instructions are confusing even for attorneys. So you have to follow the, the instructions. You have to file all the documents. If you don't, you're going to get a rejection from either USCIS or the immigration court. And if you get that rejection before, well, when the year is already passed, you're going to have problems with the one year deadline. All these, all these things that I'm talking about, obviously, we as attorneys, we can, we can fight for our clients and try for them to not, you know, not happen. But we always have to try to not have these kind of problems. So follow the instructions. My recommendation is to go to an immigration attorney and include all the supporting documents that are required. What are supporting documents? Declarations, news reports, police reports, medical reports, letters. I know it's, it's not easy to be to have been persecuted in your home country and then have to file police reports, maybe. I have clients that do not have the ability to produce these documents. I always tell my clients that um, their testimony should be enough, but if you have the documents uh, or you are able to get the documents somehow, it would be better to file them. I. I'm putting here to send them, with, send them with the asylum application, but if you get them after you file the asylum application, you can also send them to either USCIS or the immigration court and use it in your, in your interview or your individual hearing. So who can be included in your asylum application? Let's say you're here and you are married you came with your husband and your kids, but you were the one that was persecuted. Or maybe they were persecuted because of you. But you can include your spouse and your children that are in the United States. And their children, if they are under 21, if they are not under, 20, under 21 years old, you have to file an asylum application for each of your kids that are over 21. If for some reason you cannot include them in the application that you were filing first before the one day year deadline, you can also amend the asylum application and file, it, uh, file their derivatives after. If your family is not here for some reason because life happens and you, we don't know what's what is the fact of this, each client. When you, you are near asylum is granted, you can ask for those family members. You can ask for your spouse or your children under 21. 
What are the restrictions? There are some restrictions that affect the eligibility to apply for asylum. You did not follow the one-year deadline. There are also, as I said before, there are exceptions to this rule, but it's better than you file before the year. Had a previous asylum application denied by an immigration judge or the Board of Immigration Appeals. Or you can be removed to a safe third country under a two-party or multi-party agreement between the United States and other countries. I know this is a little confusing, but one of the things that you have to prove in asylum is that you cannot go to another country and be safe or you can not stay in, the, in your home country and just move within your home country, okay? What happens if you have a criminal record? You will not be eligible for asylum if you have in your record the following crimes. Conviction of a particular serious, particularly serious crime, commission of a serious non-political crime outside the United States, reasons to believe that you are a danger to the security of the United States, participation in terrorist activities and persecution of others. Asylum, it's a relief that is always, dis always discretionary, which means that if you are uh, a danger to the security of the United States, even if you have a good case of asylum, it may be denied for, the, for that reason, okay? What is important to remember? I think I have said it like five or six times. You have to file the asylum before a year after you come to the United States. You can include in your asylum application your spouse and your children under 21 that are living in the United States. You have to follow the instructions for the I-589 form and include the, all the supporting evidence required. Do you have any questions? One year timeline threshold. Why one, like, would it impact if someone filed a couple of years after? Well, you can file a couple of years. As I said, uh, uh, there are exceptions to the one-year rule. Right. You can file a couple of years after if the reason you're filing for asylum, it's, it just happened in your home country. For example, you have a spouse that is in your home country and he's being persecuted. And because you're his, his spouse or his wife, you're gonna be persecuted if you go back. That's one of the exceptions. Another exception is that you had an attorney that w did not do a good representation of you in the, and didn't file the asylum application. I had that case once. It's very difficult. You have to file an, a complaint uh, against the attorney and you have to prove that the attorney didn't do their job. But it's there and you can use it if you want. So as I said, there are exceptions to that rule, but it's better that you file before the year. Yeah. The US has agreements with other countries, so they might, might not send you back to your home country, but they may send you to other countries. Yeah, I heard of a case that the agreement was with Mexico and the person was sent to Mexico and not to his or her home country. They, they do these arrangements in order to be able to do these things. I haven't seen it. I haven't had a client who this happened. I had a client who could not be sent to his home country because a hurricane just happened and uh, the United States didn't have any, any, any person who was there to receive him because the, it was a very small island and they, didn't, they could not receive him. So that happened to me once. And I don't know what happened to the client, but he was able to stay here. You mentioned one of the reasons why your asylum could be denied is if you're a threat to the US. What does mm -hmm. that mean? Or the officer or the judge uh, have information that you can be a threat, that you committed a crime, that you 
were part of an organization that was a terrorist organization. Um, that's why I said asylum is discretionary, so the, secu the security of the United States is going to be one of the reasons, the main reasons, not the main reason, but one of the reasons that you can be denied. Because the United States doesn't want to hear people that it's going to threat the people that already lives in, live in the United States or American citizens. So they can protect you under asylum law, but they are not going to put their, their country in jeopardy doing that. The first book, just to follow up on hers, it says that a serious crime in the US, what, does, what uh, qualifies as a serious crime in the US? I decided to put serious crime because it's not necessarily a felony. There are things that maybe you think that are, are not going to affect a case in immigration, even if it's something that you think it's not important, and it, and it is. So um, that's why I always say to go to an attorney because, and Catherine is going to talk about this, but an immigration attorney is important. This is very specific law. Immigration law is, it changes all the time. So when I say serious crime, some, someone has to analyze, analyze, analyze if the crime that the client committed is a serious crime under immigration law. And it, no, it is not necessarily a felony. It's a complicated definition of some crimes that are not necessarily felonies, but under immigration law, they prevent you to get relief. So that's why, depending on the crime that you have, you have to, it has to be analyzed by someone that knows the law. It depends on the crime, so. Like a parking? <laughs> Not a parking ticket. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm going to tell you something. I once had a client that had um, misdemeanors in a state, which I'm not going to say which state, and that prevented him to apply for DACA. And it was misdemeanors of driving misdemeanors. So you have to you have to, to go to someone that knows and do the analysis and tell you because something that you said eh, that's not important maybe it is so what would be the average time if i was to submit a an application today <laughs> um <laughs> uh, anywhere from six months to two years or three years in the US, in USCIS, in court, it depends because we are having new courts moving right now in the area right now. So there are some courts that have the ability to see your asylum, your individual hearing more quickly, but in the asylum office, I, I don't, I don't know, a long time. <laughs> it's what I can say. Um, we as attorneys have to work with the expectations of clients because immigration law is very slow. It's, slow that, it's slower than any law that I have practiced since I started being a lawyer, and that was a long time ago, so it takes a long time. In case in immigration, it takes like a simple case, nine months. So. Well, right now, I think they're understaffed, and COVID happened, and uh, they are slow. They were slow before, so now they're slower. <laughs> yeah. After um, you stop recording, I can tell you my real opinion, but I'm not going to do that right now. <laughs> So you file the asylum application, you're going to receive a receipt if it's in USCIS in, in the court, you're going to have a stamp that you went to the court and file it. Some courts are now 
using electronics, so you're gonna have the receipt that you find it. Normally you're gonna have a master if, it's, if you're in immigration court, where it's, it's more like a status hearing, more or less. If you already filed, in that master you're gonna get your, if well, everything goes smoothly, and in that master you're gonna get your, your date for your individual hearing, and then when the individual hearing comes, like, you have to start preparing for it like six, six months before, and then um, you submit all the evidence that you have, you prepare your witnesses, you, now I am trying or using the witnesses from outside the United States in my immigration uh, hearings, because everything is through the computer, so what's the difference of someone being in, I don't know, El Salvador or being here if it's through the computer. So you prepare your witnesses and you file all your documents and it's 30 days before and then you have your, your individual hearing. That's a very compressed uh, timeline. Things can um, com get complicated, but more or less is that. In USCIS, you're gonna have your interview and you have, are gonna have time before to file all the documents and your, what it's called a brief and then you will have your interview. The interview is, is more casual, it's for, with an officer, it's not, it's not a setting that looks like a court, it's a, an office and there's, well, in COVID there's two offices and you look at each other through a computer, so. But it's a, a more casual thing. In the court it's like, you have a judge and you have someone that is translating, et cetera. And uh, you have your um, interview at the asylum office, and they are supposed to give you uh, a decision quickly. That happens sometimes. Sometimes you have to you have to wait a long time. Judges normally make a decision the same day, and you can decide if you are going to appeal or or you are granted asylum. And, the attorney for the government it's going to appeal or not. But the asylum office they reserve the they reserve the decision and they send it through mail or tell you when it's gonna be ready and you can pick it up at the office. And we serve um, victims of immigration legal services fraud. So I'm gonna do a quick presentation on that specifically today. And we I'm doing that because um, we know that for a lot of people who fear returning to their country or think they might have an asylum claim, they are particularly vulnerable for it to, to being victims um, of these individuals who um, try to take advantage of their vulnerable situation and um, try to take advantage of them and um, help them file their asylum application and make mistakes or wrong and do not even have the um, licenses that allow them to do that legally. So today um, we're going to talk about um, who can represent me in an immigration case, um, give an example of legal services fraud, um, and talk about why it's important to catch fraud in cases, and also talk about legal remedies to fraud, um, fraud prevention, prevention being the most important thing, and then other scams that we've come across that we just wanted to share, and finally end with some questions. So first, who can represent me in my immigration case? Um, so not everybody is allowed to help with an immigration case. Um, there's actually laws that say that only certain people are allowed to be to work on your case. And so one of those, of course, um, number one is an attorney. But an attorney who is licensed to practice in any state um, or territory in the United States. So if someone says, well, I'm an attorney in my home country, I'm an attorney in, in Canada or Mexico right next door, that doesn't count. They have to be licensed to practice law in the US. Um, second, something called an accredited representative. Basically, this is someone who's not an attorney but has a special um, accreditation by the Department of Justice 
Generally, these people um, have to work for a nonprofit. So they're very, very specific, and you would find them at a nonprofit. They wouldn't be working for a private lawyer. Um, third, a law student or law graduate who's supervised by a licensed attorney. And finally, there is um, a, a, a of exception for a reputative individual who has a pre-existing relationship with the immigrant and who receives no payment for their existence. So an example here is I want to file a form and um, my aunt can help me fill out that form. As long as she's not giving me legal advice, she's just helping me fill out name here, and, and also she's not receiving any payment for her services. And again, this is a trusted individual. I'm not going to a store or any office for this. And so what is uh, legal services fraud? So who cannot help me with my immigration case? So case writers, um, that's a term for someone saying, oh, I'm a case writer, I can help you with the immigration case. That's not true, they, can, they cannot practice law. A notary public, um, so they cannot practice law. And then other non-attorneys um, who say, no, I'm not an attorney, but I'm allowed to do asylum cases. That doesn't exist. They cannot provide representation. And that also means that they're not allowed to select which document for you to apply, and they're not allowed to prepare documents or offer any kind of advice. The only thing they're allowed to do is provide translation assistance. So very simply, um, you know, this is, I, I bring to you a form, what does this say? And then they can translate it for you. That, anyone who's, is allowed to do, they don't have to be attorneys, but that's really limited. So for example, if I say, I'm really scared of going back to my country, I don't know what to do, I don't know what that means, they, no, if they say, oh, it sounds like you need asylum, here's the form that you need to fill out, um, and be sure to fill it out this way. None of that's okay. That's all considered practicing law and giving legal representation and advice. And so um, this is, and so, this is an example of a flyer of an individual in Maryland who got in trouble for this. Um, and so sometimes that these advertisements will say things like, I'm an attorney, uh, um, you know, I can practice law. So how do you know what the difference? If they're saying I'm an attorney, how are you supposed to know they're not? So one thing that really helps is the most important question to ask, other than of course the attorney's name, is where do you have a license to practice law? Anyone who's an attorney is very easily gonna answer that. They're gonna say DC or Maryland, or since this is immigration law, they might even say um, California, that's allowed for immigration law. Um, but if they say Canada, that's not okay. They say anything else, or if they don't answer, if they're kind of slow to answer or seem really nervous, there's no reason for them to be nervous, that, to, be nervous to answer that question if they're a real attorney. And then, um, also, once you get their name, another thing you can do to check is go to um, this website, um, and this website lists all of the different states and um, bar associations, and what you can do is actually uh, look up their name to see if they're really an attorney. So I'll give an example. So this website takes you to a list of all the, all the states. This is what DCs looks like. So you can put their first name and their last name, quick search, and they'll pop up to see if they are actually barred in DC. Um, that there was the, uh, the, uh, the direct um, website address for DC. Here it is for Maryland, here's the address, and then again, just put their first and last name in and see if their name pops back up. And then here it is for Virginia. So now that I talked about what fraud is, why is it important to catch it in my case? Um, so first of all, of course, as I said, this is against federal and state law to practice law when you're not an attorney or one of those other exceptions I talked about. But most importantly, having somebody um, commit fraud and helping you in your immigration case can lead to damage to your legal case and loss of uh, immigration remedy, which means basically loss of a pathway to citizenship or a green card that you might have had. So what's an example? Um, as Beatrice just mentioned, there is a one-year filing deadline for asylum with very few exceptions that, are, that can be difficult to prove. And so say you to go to an attorney 
a non-attorney, excuse me, um, who doesn't really know the law and says, um, okay, let's file it, um, get, let's work on it for the next three months, you miss the one-year filing deadline, you missed your shot at asylum there, and you don't fall under one of the exceptions, um, and then once that asylum is denied because you missed your one-year filing deadline, you're then put into removal proceedings and the gov then you get deported. And that, that's a really serious consequence for um, because somebody helped you who didn't actually understand the law. Um, and of course, loss of money to fraudulent representatives, because you know, what we're really talking about are people who are taking advantage of vulnerable individuals saying, give me money and I can give you your immigration case all set. And, and so of course, that's a huge issue. And then finally, um, you know, it is also important because if you figure it out and report it, um, that this is an individual who is uh, doing immigration legal services fraud, that's preventing future harm to others who are also, could be in the vulnerable situation. So if you think that you or someone you know might be a victim of immigration services fraud, what can you do about it? There might be legal remedies, which means fixes to this your situation. So this falls under a couple of situations. So civil remedies means um, that you're going to basically take some action, file some sort of complaint, and try to get your money back. Um, just complain about this person's behavior and try to get them to stop by try to get the law to get them to stop. Um, may, and this might be a way to get your money back. I should note that it, it can be very difficult to get your money back in this, these situations, but it is a possibility. Uh, second, criminal remedies, meaning you basically, you bring, the, um, bring up what this person's doing to the state, and because again, what they're doing is a crime, and there may be, um, the, law, the state may get them to stop by charging them with a crime, which is what happened in the case of that um, flyer that I brought up earlier. And finally, what's often really, really important to people is, is there now a way to fix my immigration case? And the answer is it, it really depends. Um, sometimes it's really, really hard to fix your immigration case once it's been led astray, but there are possibilities there, and, and that really is where you would, um, we recommend you go to a immigration attorney, a real immigration attorney, and a reputable immigration attorney to discuss what options you would have in that situation. Um, so this, this part then is kind of all about prevention, because again, it may be possible, but it is hard to fix a situation once it's gone bad, so prevention is the most important part. Um, and so I think um, you mentioned you hope there would be a quiz. <laughs> There's not a quiz, but it is a uh, fun problem. <laughs> so I'm going to read this, and uh, I want us all to think about, are, is there anything here that seems a little fishy or not right? So Sarah is referred to Ruth by a friend for immigration help. So R Ruth tells Sarah that she is a case writer who can help with Sarah's case. The fees will be ongoing, but the initial consult is $150. Ruth guarantees Sarah will find lawful permanent residency, uh, will obtain lawful permanent residency. Also, Ruth prefers to meet over the phone or in Sarah's home. She urges Sarah to file for the 10-year rule, which will cost $4,500, um, but only $1,000 to start the process. She says all Sarah has to do is file her taxes and Ruth can help with the tax filing since she's also a tax preparer. Ruth says Sarah qualifies for the 10 year rule because Sarah has a US born children and has been living in the US for more than 10 years. Sarah asks, Ruth asks Sarah to sign a blank form she says she will fill and then send out for Sarah. Sarah never receives a copy of the application form. So, Raise your hand if you see anything that you think is a little fishy about this story. Great, fantastic. <laughs> you all passed the test and you all raised your hand. So I want to go through with some of the things that really should, um, should be a cause for concern about whether or not Ruth is actually qualified. So first of all, again, the word case writer, is, that's not the same as an attorney, and that's not somebody who can help with an immigration case. So if you identify as that, then that's a, then we need to think, well, what are you actually helping me with? Is it something that's legal representation? 
The second really, really difficult, um, really big red flag thing that should say, oh, this is this is a problem, is, is Ruth guarantees that Sarah will obtain lawful permanent residency. A immigration lawyer, even the best immigration lawyer in all the land, cannot guarantee anything. They should not, cannot guarantee anything. They, we just don't know what the government's going to do. Um, and it's and we it's really important for me when I try to talk to my clients that they understand all of their risks. Uh, nothing's guaranteed, and so anyone who's guaranteeing something that's trouble. Um, the third, uh, Ruth prefers to meet over the phone or in Sarah's home, and so of course during COVID, meeting over the phone is very very normal. But usually, um, if an attorney, usually an attorney will have some sort of ability to meet in an office. They wouldn't be asking you to go to your home, for example. Um, and so that can be something to, uh, to think about. Um, then we have here the $4,500, but only $1,000 to get the application. So getting the application is free. Applications are always free from the website. It can cost money to file it. You may need to pay money with the application to submit it to USCIS. But just downloading the form, that's always going to be free. So if someone's charging you to even look at the form, that's a problem. Um, again, filing taxes. Tax preparers are another kind of, you say, oh, I'm a tax preparer and I can also help with your immigration case. That's another common thing we hear. Tax preparers are not the same as attorneys. And this 10-year rule we brought up because that's a common, um, that's a common uh, thing that somebody who's trying to commit fraud will say because it misrepresents something that is real, which is called cancellation of removal, that you can apply for if, you've al if you're already in immigration court, if the government's already trying to deport you. That is something you can apply for. It's not something you can apply for just on a form. You have to already be in deportation proceedings. And it's not as simple as, you know, you had US children, you've not been in trouble, you filed your taxes, and you've been here for 10 years. It's that rule, that that rule where you can just get a status through that, that unfortunately, very unfortunately, does not exist. And the final two things, um, signing a blank form, um, it's very dangerous to sign a blank form because you just don't know what the person's going to fill out. So anyone who's asking you to sign a blank form, that's trouble. And finally, never receiving a copy of the application form. That's your property, your application. You can, should always be able to get a copy of your application. And so here are a couple of um, tips, again, to kind of based on that, uh, of, of things to keep in mind. So always make sure that the person you hire is licensed to practice law in the U.S. Um, again, in the U.S. being um, one of the key parts there. To um, never pay someone who will not give you a receipt or contract. Um, every attorney is going to want to sign in a contract with you, and you should ask for a copy if they don't already have one to you. Receipts for all payments. They, no attorney sh would ever, should ever say, oh, uh, I don't want to give you a contract or a receipt. We, we love contracts, you know, because it protects you, it protects us. Um, and so anyone who doesn't want to give you that, even if they are a real attorney, then that's actually a bad attorney. Get your contract. Um, don't leave behind original documents. This is true no matter who you're going to, things like your passport, um, you know, paper, that's really important. Um, you can make copies and give them to your legal representative or, you know, you know, give it to them, have them make copies and then take it back with you. And this, maybe it's a real attorney who doesn't even mean poorly, but you don't want to take that risk and so always hang on to your original documents. And then this, very, very important, never sign anything you don't understand or that's left blank. That's true um, all across the board. And it's very risky, especially in the US, because the US government takes signatures very, very seriously. So if you sign something that you don't understand or that's blank and then somebody else fills it out later, and it turns out there's something in there that's a lie or that actually hurts your case, It'll be very hard after the fact to say, oh, I didn't, I didn't know that what that meant. I, I didn't know that. The US government will take, it says, okay, but you signed it, so why did you sign it if you don't understand? They take signatures very, very seriously, so it's really good to be careful with your signature. Um, and then again, always get a copy of all applications in your case. That's your property, your, it's your right to ask all questions, make sure you understand everything. 
Um, it's your right to get copies of papers. It's your life. It's your case. And so don't feel like you're bothering them. You know, if you're if you've hired somebody, you're paying them money, and so to help with your case. And so you have the right to all that. Even if you're not paying them money, even if it's a nonprofit, that's still your life. It's your case. So feel empowered to can ask those questions, get copies. Um, and make sure things are, uh, uh, you understand things and you feel like you have a good grasp of everything. So very, very quickly, I'm just gonna end on a couple of other scams that we um, have come across. So one is immigration bail bond companies, um, where uh, companies that say, so you have a family member who's in detention, they need to post bail or pay money to get out of detention. We can uh, put up that money for you. Some of them um, are, are just are scams, predatory, so really watch out for that. ICE government imposter scams, where someone will call and say, we're ICE, we have your family member, or we're ICE and we want you to, we want to um, hear from you. Um, ICE will never call you and ask for money, and they, you, know, you won't be able to give them money over the phone. So if, um, you can always ask if you're concerned about, is this real? to say, well, what's your name and what agency are you from? Um, and get that information down, write it down, and then you can even say, well, I can, I can call you back with an attorney, and, and then leave the conversation that way. Um, scam English courses, this is something that came up a couple years ago where there was a real English course, but was asking for information like, oh, what's your immigration status? What's your address? And then use that information to extort their clients. Um, basically saying, oh, well, we know you're undocumented, give us more money. So really, if anybody's asking you about your immigration status, um, think about why that is and be really careful with that information. Um, and, and just if you feel like somebody's asking you for too much information, then that's just trust your instinct on that. And finally, like I said, um, immigration forms are free online. You may have to pay money to submit them, but to just download them and look at them, that never costs money, so if someone's charging you to get an immigration form, then that is a scam. Um, and, and in general, you know, because I popped this slide up because I know it's, it's someone saying, oh, I'm, I'm ICE or I'm immigration, I'm an immigration officer. Um, you, again, they shouldn't be calling you, they wouldn't be calling you. We did pop this up for if I mean, the real one comes, you also still have rights. You don't have to speak to them. You don't have to answer. If they don't have a warrant that's signed by a judge or magistrate, you don't have to let them in your house. Or if, if they say, can I have permission to search your bag? Um, they don't have paper. You don't have to say yes. I know it's difficult, um, but this is important to know your rights that you, there's a lot of things that it's, you know, it's so easy in the moment to just say, okay, yes, whatever. You know, I, I always, I feel that too. It's so easy to say, like, it'll be easier if I just say yes, whatever you want, but that's not true. And you have rights and you don't have to um, give someone permission to enter your home if they don't have that warrant signed by a judge or ma magistrate. Stay calm, do not lie and do not show false documents. Um, you know, don't run or physically resist arrest, but you can calmly assert your rights. And that's it. And so um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Hear about it. Could you uh, tell about who's holding of removal, what it is, and uh, what requirements? The government or the uh, immigration judge is going to decide that you are not going to be removed from the United States. The good thing about withholding of removal is that you don't have to file in the one year. You have to be persecuted and you have to prove persecution also, but it doesn't have the one year deadline. The problem is that withholding of removal um, doesn't necessarily give you as asylum the possibility of doing an adjustment and become a legal permanent resident in the United States. But I can, it's, it's more complicated than that. That's why I always say to go to an attorney, but you file for withholding of removal in the same form. You just, uh, in, the, in the top part of the form, you say you, can, you, are going, you are filing for withholding of removal and from CAT, which is the Convention Against Torture, and you file for the three things. It's just asylum is a more completed relief if, that makes sense, if that makes sense.
And does that answer your question? Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. Um, I just wanted to you know if there, are, like, if somebody has has to move because they're filing within that state, right? Mm -hmm. um, if they move, how does that impact their asylum case? And then you can do a change of venue. Okay. Uh, you can do a change of venue. It has some um, some uh, disadvantages because when you do a change of venue, the the court understands that you are um, like stopping the case and the clock for you to have an employment authorization is gonna stop if you do that. So it, it, it's, it has his details, but you can do a change of venue. Actually, most of the clients, or some clients, start the case in one state and then move it to another and that that's that's okay actually so it, it doesn't affect your case your application it could affect other things but not the application one more question. yeah um let's say like your case is taking so long like in some weird thing is there anything you could do or are you just waiting for it to if you are in immigration court, I have in the past asked the judge for a uh, hearing that it's, that's not a lot, that's expedited. expedited, but the problem is immigration judges have a lot of work, so sometimes they don't have a slot for you. Um, in USCIS, it's the same thing. You can ask for an SPI request in any application, actually. For it, for it. You can ask for it. You're not necessarily going to, it's not necessarily going to be granted. But I have had cases where if I'm in the master with the client and uh, I ask for earlier dates for my client, I can switch with another attorney and find an attorney that has a hearing before that I can use, and the attorney has mine. Mm -hmm. So I have done that in the past. Um, normally clients in immigration court, they, are, they have fear to have their, uh, in, they, their individual hearings, so they don't want to have it. But I have, I have had good cases that I have asked that. Yes. Are there instances where a change in venue aids your application? Because I've heard of instances where someone started a process in one state, it was backlogged for years, and then they moved to another, and then it ended up being processed a little bit faster. So is it? Yes, it depends on the court. Okay. It depends on the on, on the docket that the court has. Okay. So, for instance, we have a new court in Hyattsville right now, and they're seeing cases in October. So it's very, very, uh, it's more quickly, but in a court like Baltimore or some cases in Arlington, it's like four or five years. But even outside of the court, when we think of the backlog process. There are some cases in USCIS that are very quickly, that they, they give you the interview quickly because they have this system that some cases they enter and they want to it's the theories are some cases that you file and they are quicker because in their system those cases some cases are going to be quicker than others i honestly don't understand their system never have but yes there are cases in the asylum office that are quicker than others there are some of the cases that take years and some in just six months you have your interview. Any other question? Okay. Thank you everyone.